many times have you been beaten up by the police? Every fucking time. Every time? Every time. I sold it in some way, yeah. Every time. And, and seriously? Seriously. You get lumped the fuck up, though, believe me. That's an excerpt from a conversation I had earlier today with Richie Anapuna. You're listening to Doug TV. Richie and I talking about being in jail together and the criminal justice system. Today we talk about it some more and the degree to which it is corrupted. Absolutely not the institution most people think it is. Last time I mentioned that over 1% of American adults are in prison, roughly the population of Denmark. I also wanted to mention that there are another 5 million people on parole and probation. Those are people who until very recently were in jail or prison. That's one in every 35 people who just in the past few years have been in jail or prison. America's police live in a lawless world. And anybody, anybody can be arrested for anything, anytime and get a hefty sentence for absolutely nothing. I am living proof of that. Also, if you listened in last time, you heard Richie with a lot of energy. Today, he was not feeling particularly well, and he hasn't been for some time. He is in stage five kidney failure and hoping for a new kidney, and actually at this point, hoping that he's well enough for the surgery. He has an air of optimism these days that I've never seen him have before, however. And I very much admire his strengths and his willingness to deal with so much pain and the love that he has for his children. I'm also grateful that he made the time to come over today and that he had the energy to do it. So without further ado, let's get right into our conversation. Hey, Doug. How you doing, buddy? Not bad. It's good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. 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 Been in the hospital. Yep, I haven't been doing good health-wise, but uh, optimistic. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, it's good to see you. Last time we left off with Richie saying that the only crimes he ever committed were being an Annapuna and being from Kensington. That's right, Doug. I just was speaking with my mother the other night, <clears throat> and she said to me, uh, you know, your father... And his family always had problems with the police in the neighborhood uh, when they used to, when they were just dating. Um, you know, he would always get pulled over and, you know, yeah. harassed all the time. Even when they pulled me over, they used to always say, you know, oh, ain't you a fucking Antipuna? This, you know, so I mean. It was always like that. Uh, I remember some story about some specious tickets. Every day. Every day. Every day. What would they do? $1,200 in tickets every day. Every day. Every day. And then it got it worse, you know. Um, I had a big truck, and uh, it had big wheels, <clears throat> loud system and all. Yeah. So it got so bad that... I'm driving down Lehigh Ave and hit Kensington and Lehigh, and a cop pulls me over. Mm -hmm. He jumps out of his car with a tape measure in hand. Now, this is a, a regular police officer in a squad car jumping out with a tape measure. Yeah. And I see him, you know, he's going walking around the truck measuring the tires, the height, the width. Yeah. I didn't have mud flaps. My bumper was too high because of the height of the truck. He was ready for you. He was ready. Yeah. And I got a lot more than twelve hundred dollars worth of tickets that day. <laughs> <laughs> so every day after that, that same cop would then do that. Well. So it was like nuts. Yeah. But when I was backing into the garage where I kept the uh, truck, uh -huh. two detectives pulled up as I was backing it in and said, uh, "You know, these were." plainclothes detectives in a car, you know, unmarked car. Mm -hmm. They stopped 
beat the horn while I was backing in. I, I looked down and they said, oh, this is where you hide this motherfucker. So we were also talking about Matt Zimmerman toward the end there. And we didn't really get uh, get to the end. He's been in prison for quite a while now. Uh, 20 years. 20 years. Yeah, this November will be 20 years. Yeah, and I'd like to remind people that the one piece of evidence that was hard evidence, it was a bloody handprint clearly by the... Bloody palm print, yeah. Go um, ahead. Yeah. Bloody, uh, bloody palm print was left in Matthew Zimmerman's mother and father's blood that was on the floor. And, you know, when it coagulated, there was an obvious good print. Yeah. And uh, the detective somehow knocked over uh, the, the, the light panels into the palm print and, you know, said it's uh, unusual. But... He's fighting, his lawyer's fighting to get that palm print brought back to evidence, but they're saying they don't know where the chain of custody went and what happened to it. It's just all these amazing uh, events that take place that you would like. It's almost like a movie script. <laughs> yeah, well... Like, I, I mean, first of all, they knocked the thing over into the only hard piece of evidence they have to find the real killer. Yeah, they couldn't find any of my mm-hmm. evidence, and right. yet the judge let it all stand as valid, hard evidence. Matthew's attorney just put in a uh, rebuttal for the uh, new hearing. Uh, within the next couple of months, we should know. So, yeah. you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, and and even if they find you innocent, you can still be in jail for a few more years. Yeah, because you know, you know how long it takes to get released. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotta, a process. They got to find all your paperwork that's yeah. lost with the evidence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, they got my computer. They got they got all kinds of stuff. I'm, I, I imagine they just gave it to their nephews and nieces and whatnot. Yeah, they do that. Did you see that thing I posted up the other day about the uh, homicide detective getting a blowjob at Ruth and Venango Street? No, what happened? Well, he, a neighbor videoed him, and he got out of the car like a tough guy. He's like, you don't even fucking know. Like, in other words, I'm a fucking homicide detective. And dude said, the, the guy, the neighbor who was videoing him told him, yo, don't put your hands on him, I'll knock you the fuck out. I'm a golden gloves, he kept saying. I'm a golden gloves. So the cop kept coming toward him. Now, he wasn't in uniform, and he was just getting a blowjob from a hooker. Uh-huh. So dude knocked him straight the fuck out. Uh-huh. Now, the homicide detective lost his job and everything or whatever. It was on dude. You know, there's an investigation. But my point is, this isn't an isolated incident. This no. happens fucking daily. No, and that's what I really want people to understand is that nothing Richie and I are talking about is anything like unusual. No. I have a joke for you, Richie. Go ahead. Why does everybody in jail and in prison think they're innocent? I give up. Because they are. <laughs> <laughs> and the, <clears throat> people say, well, they did something. Yeah, but you don't go to prison for something. If you're charged with, you know, having weapons of mass destruction as I was, they didn't turn up any. They didn't turn up anything. There was nothing, nothing. It's all about selling papers, getting people to watch the news. Yeah. Filling the courts and, and filling them, the jail, and keeping their jobs. That's and keeping their jobs. That's right. You, you know you can't keep you can't keep running in an election year on uh, promises you couldn't keep. So that's when they start mustering up fucking fake ass homicides and fake drug deals and yeah. get p- pay people to just fucking give them anything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I met a guy in prison. He was a he was a drug dealer, all right, but that's not what he was arrested for. Uh, they they took all of his drug money. They took fifty thousand dollars from him that somehow never got uh, never got entered into evidence. It never does. Magical, isn't it? And um, you know they couldn't find anything in his house except he had a Civil War coin that they traced and had belonged to somebody else. 
who had been a criminal. So they, they gave him five years for having stolen property. <laughs> um, and, and the truth is, is that they could, I think, find, they could follow these guys around and find out what they're really doing. They just don't. I was in a house. I was uh, 16. Uh-huh. A uh, fellow who lived there, my cousin who passed away, Franny, mm-hmm. was selling out front and saw the cops coming and threw the bundle of crack in the house where I was. Uh-huh. I'm sleeping. He runs, but the cops see the house that he throws it in. This is uh, Officer King and Officer Zambino. You're yeah. your best friend. So they come busting through the door. They're slapping me the fuck around, uh, waking me up. I'm like, whoa. And they're like, oh, we got you now. Ain't he pasta? So uh, they're getting ready. To, you know, they lock me up, and they lock another guy who was there, Gramps, rest in peace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're in the back of the pad, uh, getting ready to go out the door to be taken to the paddy wagon. And another, the guy upstairs, Joe Morphew, he moved mm-hmm. in the bed. Now Joe Morphew was upstairs sleeping. Uh-huh. They didn't know he was until he moved. Uh-huh. You know, and then they said, what the fuck was that? And I just shrugged my shoulder. I don't know. Officer King ran upstairs. Mm-hmm. After he ran, gets upstairs, I hear, put it the fuck down. Bop, bop, bop. Really? And he threw, he shot Joe Morphew, threw him down the fucking steps. Like he threw him down the steps. Mm-hmm. Shot him three times, threw him down the steps. At that point, I say to Gramps, you know they're going to fucking kill us. <laughs> I was 16 at that time. And I was wow. like, they're going to fucking kill us, dude. So he comes down the steps and he's like, this motherfucker reached for something. And and Joe Morphy was like, I was reaching for my remote control to shut the TV off. Wow. You know, he was an older man. Wow. So now I'm in a cell in the 25th district. For, that, they, they arrested you. Oh, yeah. Of course. They beat us the fuck down and all. I got beat down and everything. I was fucked up that night. So he comes to the yeah. cell. Good uh, thing there's no more police brutality. He comes to the cell and he's like, well, yeah, Annie Pasta, we got all your fucking shit here. And I was like, ain't none of that shit mine. So then they come in and they say, oh, here's the gun he was reaching for. They bring a fucking model black powder cap and ball gun into the district in an evidence bag. Even the other cops started laughing. They're like, what? Where'd they get it? It was in a box. Uh-huh. Put away. It was a model uh-huh. that, he, that he made. Oh, oh, it was yeah. in a box, put away in the closet, and they brought it. Like, That's what he's reaching for. My point is, is they, they, mu- they muster anything up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like they were trying to say they had all my shit. You ain't got nothing. What happened to the crack that your cousin threw in the house? Um, we didn't get charged for it. was only a bundle, and they there was a shooting. We sat in the fucking paddy wagon for probably 16 hours outside. Uh-huh. While, the, you know, because uh, the, the detectives had to come, uh, internal affairs... <laughs> you know, before we can even be transported to the 25th district. Yeah. I, I think what's worse than shooting someone, almost, it's just as bad, is when a cop gets up and lies about you on the stand. They do that all the time. All the time. They are trained to lie. Mm-hmm. And then they'll tell you, we're trained liars because that's our investigative tools. What? That's fucking crazy. I understand that a narc can lie to you and say he's a narc. Or say he's he's not a narc. Excuse me. Well, all that shit I'm not talking about. I'm talking about when they take the stand. They just straight lie. I beat a lot of my cases because cops lied and got caught in their lies. And then they're still allowed to testify. Don't you remember the list? Yeah, but there's only 20 people who are actually on it. There's 60 who are under suspicion. Which I don't know what that means. They've been caught red-handed. <laughs> I mean, but 40 of them are still allowed to testify. I, I don't care what anybody says. Cop, detective, district attorney, judge, lawyer, politician. All fucking lying scumbag. That's what they get paid to do. And because cops... If they're not good liars, they don't have a job. Yeah, yeah and because cops actually are trained to lie, they get the uh, 
they get the idea that it's okay to lie anywhere, anytime, anytime. About anything. That is correct. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. It's, meanwhile, uh, they'll bust you for pulling over and getting your dick sucked. But meanwhile, after they lock you the fuck up, they'll go back, pick that girl up. And get their blowjobs for free. You've known that to happen. I've seen it. It's on video. Judges fucking drinking and driving. Nothing happens to them. Yeah. Now, have you seen things about yourself in the newspaper that, uh, you know, you were arrested and charged with? Yeah. And um, I was going to say that I saw that about myself. None of it was true. Absolutely everything in the newspaper was fiction. Because it's the only the account of the arresting officer. And and I realized something the other day when I was watching the news, which is that the only people who get a chance for a newspaper rebuttal are cops when they get arrested. Exactly. Yeah. I, I believe that journalists should... I don't know that, that they can be required by law to do it, but I think they should ethically... Journalism is not sides. fair. It's always a one-sided story, and it's that... Unless it's a cop who gets arrested. But I think a good journalist could... I mean, I was just cooling my heels in jail for a year before my trial. I tried calling the press. I they don't want to talk to you. No, they sure don't. They don't want your story. They're paid by officials to take certain statements. Are they? Come on, dude. I don't know. Well, why does only certain statements get 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 out? You know, post it. I think that's a good stopping place for today. Richie makes an interesting and controversial point, and I would have disagreed with it a year ago. Today, I'm not sure what I think, but I think it's worth considering. Why is there only one point of view in any news story that relates to the police? We've all seen lately, particularly with the Me Too movement, that the press can be judge, jury, and executioner. People rejoice, not after someone's gone to trial or been convicted of anything, but having been suspected of something and called out by a member of the press is essentially enough. In my case, it brought on a conviction, which was largely based on fictional news stories that said I had major explosives, IEDs, weapons of mass destruction, when in fact I had three firecrackers. Perhaps unbelievable, but absolutely true. In other cases, it's enough, even if they don't go to jail, to ruin somebody's relationships, family life, reputation, job, even if the charges are entirely erroneous, as they were in my case. You hear people say, don't believe everything you read, but the truth is people do believe what they read in the newspaper. My five best friends from college, from art school, who I believed were family, but my closest, my very closest friends, all but one, have all absolutely abandoned me. None of them, not one of them, has spoken with me in over five years now. So thanks, Vince, for sticking in there. And my friends Sarah, Charles, and Pat, I could not have done it without them. They kept me alive while I was in prison. I think you'd have to be there to know what that means. And my kids have been a little more savvy than my friends, fortunately. And so have Richie's. Richie has his family, and they love him, and they're so happy to have him back, and so happy he's alive. So keep your fingers crossed. If you pray, say a prayer for Richie. And... I will do at least one more episode with Richie, and then I'm going to be doing as well as justice subjects, uh, art and history. And I will also be participating in a new series called Too Real, which will be about contemporary modernism and contemporary representational and realistic art. So I hope you tune in for those as well. Thanks so much for joining me today. This has been Doug Farron 
with Doug TV, this song that I wrote called Lucky Luke. Richie asked me to play it at the beginning and end of this episode. So here's a bit more of it. This episode, copyright 2019, by me, Douglas Farron. And this has been a production of Doug TV International from the Doug TV studio in the Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia. See you again next time. of Doug TV International.